Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the aquarium shed, which is in a basement. I know none of this makes sense. So this is the second part of my little series about the lava rock aquascape in my 70 litre Denerle Scapers tank. And as you can see, I'm way back in the past right now. Not a single piece of lava rock has gone in the tank. Nevertheless, I'm sure last week's cinematic video looked awesome. I'm feeling very optimistic about future me scaping. So in this video, I want to spend a little time talking to you about the aquascape and giving you a little insight into how I planned for this. And I thought by explaining it in the past, I could prove that I didn't just wing it. There was a method to my madness. Now, a few weeks ago, I boiled every piece of lava rock and mocked up the size of the tank with some duct tape so that I could start playing with a hardscape formation. I've got a few key rocks that I think work well together and will form the basis of a slightly angled arch that goes from the left foreground to the right midground. This will give some negative space which will center the eye through the arch which occupies the left third. What these scapers tanks are really good at is giving a sense of depth. And my plan is that I will draw the eye through the arch towards a smaller arch in the background. I'm then planning to heavily plant the arches and heavily plant a formation of rocks that will be in the right hand background. So let's crack on. Compared with last week's cinematic scaping video, this week I am going to talk you through all of the steps in a bit more detail and explain what was going through my head as I developed the scape. Here goes. So we start of course with the hardscape. Now I had a bunch of black and brown lava rock from previous scapes so I didn't need to buy anything new for this project. What I was conscious of though was how the two types of lava rock could look odd if positioned badly. So I tried to make sure that the brown lava rock was at the bottom and the only black lava rock made up the arch and the main negative space in the left foreground. As you can see, my technique for gluing the rock together was to use a mixture of filter floss with super glue, which is pretty similar to the method you'll see people do with cigarette filters and glue. I then also added generous globs of marine grade silicon for extra support. This is quite flexible, so I couldn't rely on it entirely, but combined with the super glue and filter floss, it seems to have worked really well. The arch was of course the trickiest bit to get right. In fact, there is a whole outtake somewhere of me just standing there holding the arch for a good 10 minutes whilst the clue set, and having an awkward conversation with Kate upstairs, who couldn't quite work out why I couldn't just run upstairs to help with something. I can't, I can't hear you. I, I, I'm sorry, Bubs, I, can't, I also can't move right now. Explain that it's because you are gluing two pieces of rock together to form a fish arch will never sound reasonable. So you'll notice that I also rely on cable ties for the arch formation. I'm pretty sure I could have cut this off after the glue set, especially as the arch is pretty self-supporting once all interlocked. Nevertheless, they were going to be well covered by moss and hydrocotyl, so I just left them in. Once I had built the second arch, that was pretty much job done on the hardscape. If I could go back in time, I'd probably have attempted to achieve slightly more height with both arches, mainly so that the back arch could have a more dramatic climbing path leading towards it. But working with what you have to hand will always lead to compromises like this. I simply didn't have the right rocks to completely achieve the vision. But it was very, very close. The final preparation is the soil. For this scape, I have a layer of porous ceramic alpha grog at the base, and this is then covered with Denerle scaper soil. The main issue was getting soil pockets on the arch so that I could grow a raised carpet of hydrocotyl tripartite. I created these beds via stuffing more filter floss into gaps and adding some extra silicon. This allowed me to put a reasonably generous layer of soil onto the top of the arch. Once the rest of the soil was all tidally formed into two big planting areas at the back corners and slightly raised areas either side of the central path, we were ready to get planting. All the plants for this project came from eBay via a seller called K2 Aqua. For a while I was a little hesitant about buying eBay plants, but over the years and as I have got to understand fertilization much more, I have realized that the quality differentiation of in vitro plants is pretty marginal. The first thing I planted was a carpet either side of the path. This is a mix of Micranthemum Monte Carlo and Hemianthus calcicroids to form a closely packed floor of small leaves with another mix of Eleocaris parvula and Sagittaria sibilata exploding out of the carpet. This combination of two grasses adds a really interesting texture and the Sagittaria really went wild in this scape. The plants that you are really drawn to in the scape are the two types of hydrocotyl that are planted on top of the arch. I wanted the nice small leaves of the hydrocotyl tripartite to dominate this space and then just a few stems of hydrocotyl verticalata to jump out of this carpet. Alongside this carpet of hydrocotyl is two types of moss, spiky and java. 
Very practically, I used the moss to fill gaps where there was filter floss visible, but I also liked the effect of some of the moss hanging in the arch and creating an interesting stencil against the blue backlight. The final bit of planting is fairly straightforward. I wanted to fill the back corners with a mix of Hygrophilia corymbosa and Ludwigia glandulosa. By having such deep greens and reds in the background, I was able to centre the eye on the mid-ground plants, which look much lighter and more impactful as a result of this contrast. I love how luscious the Ludwigia turned out in this setup. It's my first time successfully growing a red plant, and I'm really pleased it went so well on my first ever competition scape. Looking pretty cool, eh? So the first thing you'll be wondering is why the path in the middle is still a bare bottom. Uh, I don't really have a good answer for this, it's just the way I've learned to aquascape and there isn't a particularly good reason. In my head I think it's because I see no urgency to get the final result when I'm waiting for the plants to grow out anyway, so it gives me the reflective time I need to make a final decision about how I want it to look. And a week later and after a stressful week at work, Boy, have I needed that reflective pottering time with this tank. So with this tank, I am using the daily estimated index method to over fertilize. In my case, I'm using Easy Life Profito and dosing three mils per day with a weekly 50% water change. I've got my reminders written up on the whiteboard and I'm being realistic with myself and committing to a Friday or Saturday water change. So sometimes it might actually be eight days instead of seven. Now I'm sure my tank will forgive me, I hope. Okay, back to the tank. Uh, this past week I've been thinking about how to show off the arches best, and part of that has involved me putting a frosted background on which I can shine a video light through. The point being, I want to ensure that however I finish this path, it emphasises and draws the eye towards the smaller back arch to give the sense of depth. So I'm going to do the path not just with sand, but also with some river gravel mixed in. And I'm going to grade that gravel so that as the mix travels further back, the grading gets smaller as well. This is going to be a tedious process, but hopefully high impact enough that it's worth it. And as with everything about this video, at least you know there was some method to my madness, even if future me has totally messed up somehow. Right, enough rambling, time to crack on. Now, uh, what sort of music suits the wonderful task of gravel grading, I wonder? Maybe something like this. So after the gravel was graded, I brought the water level down to halfway and started to add the sand and gravel. I wanted this to trail off to the back right on the second arch. And like I said earlier, I would really have liked to achieve more height with this path. And it's something I do slightly regret as it doesn't quite have the drama I was after. Nevertheless, I do like the shape of the path and think the grading was worth it. However, this is slightly lost by not having as much light at the back of the tank as I could. I'd also thoroughly recommend this method for adding your final details whilst partially submerged. Everything takes a slightly different form and perspective when submerged in water. So being able to reflect and adjust immediately is much easier once a tank is flooded, in my opinion. So literally the entire way through this build, in my mind, this rock has been in the middle of the path and the path kind of goes either side of it and then disappears into the back. Now I'm thinking because I haven't got as much height on the path, so you can't see over the rock so easily, it might not be right. I have a feeling that this rock is going to come in and out of this scape throughout the entire process and uh, who knows if it'll be there in the end. <laughs> oh yeah, look what's arrived. Really excited. I've literally been looking out the window for the last half hour, just willing with delivery to turn up and then finally saw some guy turn up in a random black van get out, very obviously have the arrows facing up. And of course he just grabs the box by the side and chucks the fish around and uh, it's all pretty scary to watch. So fingers crossed they're all right. I'm sure they'll be fine, but it's just, uh, when you see delivery men just chucking boxes around, you're just like, oh for God's sake, what is the point in having all these things over saying live fish and having arrows on the side, but there you go. Uh, so yeah, gonna get out of the box, get them acclimatized to the I'm going to get them out of the box, get them acclimatised to the heat of each of the tanks and uh, fingers crossed they're all in good health. So here we go. Uh, I read the Daily Mail, unfortunately.
So there you go. A few weeks after the fish went into the tank, the aquascape was starting to look really luscious. And with loads of healthy fish activity going on, it was time to start taking my first IAPLC shots. Next week, I'll talk you through the photography process, but I'll leave you this week with a few more shots of this tank looking pretty awesome. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll catch you in the next video. So it's the 26th of May now, so I have five days until submission on the IAPLC and I still haven't got the perfect shot. So it really is the most bizarre amount of things now just randomly cable tied to the light. So I'm going to be cheeky, cut them and then wedge them back in. I just wanted to clarify as well that um, I by no means think that I'm going to win this competition with this tank. I am well aware that it is not up to the kind of you know top 100 standards in the slightest 